thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm sorry we've been blanked out on camera. Um, Jerome's amazing uh, slides and recordings should all be visible for people on Zoom, and they're certainly visible here um, for everybody in the class. Welcome to everybody. Um, Jerome Lewis has been a long-term friend of radical anthropology and um, needs very little introduction. He's a reader, a reader here at the UCL Anthropology Department. Jerome did his PhD with the late, great James Woodburn, um, who's a, a very one of the most famous of all hunter-gatherer anthropologists. Um, Jerome's had a, an enormous uh, length of fieldwork, dedicated fieldwork, compared to very many anthropologists in the field with the uh, Bayaka and Benjele peoples, um, studying areas of egalitarianism, um, sharing, uh, ritual, and um, uh, many aspects of Benjele society. So I'm going to um, hand over to Jerome on egalitarian civilizations. Thank you. Thank you, Camilla. Uh, and good evening, everyone. That's very nice. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I hope the anticipation will be rewarded. Um, so often people think of hunter-gatherer societies as these small little groups of, you know, between 12 and perhaps 60 maximum people living in a camp, hunting and gathering, making their livelihoods in the forest around them. Uh, but uh, the impression that gives is of uh, you know, just these disjointed, dislocated people, and it's rather a surprise. I mean, there was even an anthropologist called Ron Bruton who thought that it was even remarkable that these societies should exist at all and that actually they're just sort of accidental assemblages, that their cultures aren't really very, you know, intentional or have roots in mythology or symbolism or ritual in the way most cultures do have some sort of sense of continuity and identity uh, through their cultural practices, but were just these random assemblages. And that kind of very um, superficial reading of what egalitarian hunter-gatherers are is something which has been, for instance, uh, replicated in uh, Wengro and Graeber's recent book, The Dawn of Everything, where they dismiss the uh, many tens of thousands of years of hunter-gatherer civilizations through in different parts of the world, I would suggest, um, as, as being irrelevant to thinking about how humanity might organize its political future. And, and I think that that's a, a, a very tragic uh, omission, actually, and that uh, these hunter-gatherer groups have a huge amount to teach us about how you can organize human communities at scale uh, without the necessity of hierarchy. And that's why I, I use this rather provocative term, civilization, which in its uh, sort of common usage refers to extremely hierarchical civilizations, the sort that do the sorts of uh, things that uh, Turgot, the French philosopher or ec ec economist, argued in response to the indigenous critique that, you know, it, technological civilizations emerge because of inequality, and inequality is a necessary uh, price to pay for the free time, the leisure that the wiser uh, parts of those civilizations can then use to create these great uh, architectures, technological creations, and so on, of works of art. Um, but uh, what I want to talk about here is an alternative, a, a different way of under, understanding human beings residing at scale over large areas um, without necessarily falling prey to, to those rather um, pernicious uh, elements of human social life. Ah. Sorry, I just need to try and keep track of both. So um, recent genetic ethnographic and ethnomusicological research on Congo Basin hunter-gatherers reveals striking continuities between the small groups that dwell in these forests. These lines of evidence suggest that they form a broader Central African civilization of great antiquity. Despite their contemporary linguistic, geographic and genetic differences, the continuities between these different societies point to what remains of an optimal adaptation to this region that is expressed in the structural form or style that endures across small scale hunter gatherer groups, which unites them into a much larger uh, scale civilization. In this talk, I'm just going to summarize elements of these continuities, but I'm going to focus on how 
in particular, a distinctive musical style expresses and transmits ideal scenarios that form the basis of distinctive socio-aesthetic and political standards characteristic of this civilization. I'm going to refer to these societies collectively as a civilization because a civilization does not limit a culture to one society. Society is a short-term phenomena compared to civilizations. Members of this civilization refer to themselves as forest people, and they share taboos concerning blood that structure sharing and the gender division of labor, a predatory approach to language and a distinctive musical style. They contrast themselves to people like us that they call village people and whose hierarchical values and political structures they reject. This civilization is probably one of the oldest human civilization. Indeed, as these images imply, uh, this hunter-gatherer civilization has long fascinated the peoples of the Mediterranean basin and has had a profound impact on these much shorter lived civilizations. This interest in Central African hunter-gatherers is speculated to go back to ancient Nubia or Somalia, arriving in the form of Bess to the Egyptian Middle Kingdom around 5,000 years ago to become one of the most popular gods of the new kingdom. So of course in, in Egypt, as with typical civilizations we're familiar with, there was extreme hierarchy and inequality. And the gods of the hierarchy are the ones that we generally assume and associate uh, uh, Ibis and so on with those elites. But actually for popular people, that wasn't an accessible form of worship. Their worship was much more uh, everyday. And Bess was the most popular god in, in ancient Egypt. Uh, if you go to the museum here, one of the most frequent artifacts they have are various effigies and images of Bess. There are hundreds of them just in the local museum at UCL here. And indeed, uh, they're found right across the Mediterranean basin. Um, and it really is quite remarkable. I think Bess is probably, or at least he's, he's a very good candidate for the longest uh, worshiped God of any of human, humanity's gods. It really is quite remarkable that he has been consistently present in the uh, at least religious practices of some people uh, since that time, right up until today. Um, Although, uh, sorry, Bess was a dwarf god, uniquely represented face on. So traditionally, all those Egyptian things are sideways images, but Bess is straightforward facing. Um, as a protector against dangerous animals and of the home, he was also the patron of childbirth, fertility, sexuality, humor, music, and dancing. He became very popular with everyday Egyptians because he protected women and children above all others. Though Bess had no temples and there were no priests ordained in his name, he was often depicted on household items such as headboards of beds, other furniture, mirrors and cosmetic containers, as well as on wall paintings, especially in birth houses called mamisi in ancient Egypt, and as amulets and statuettes. Worship of Bess spread as far north as Syria and west to Cyprus and the Balearic Islands and into the Greek, Roman and the first Persian empires. Bess remains popular in Ibiza today. And it's quite interesting that Ibiza, if you translate it, means Ila di Bess, the island of Bess. And even today, one of the principal uh, uh, reasons that uh, people go to Ibiza is a pilgrimage for dance and uh, uh, eudonic pleasures. Um, when European explorers in the Congo Basin first encountered the short statured forest hunter gatherers, they were invariably labeled pygmies after the mythical group labeled pygmies by Homer in the Iliad. So this is the name pygmy is something which goes back uh, very far. It's actually how a measure of cloth was sold in Greek, uh, ancient Greek markets. Uh, it was a, a pygm is, is the length between a, a, a fist and an elbow um, and, and therefore uh, something that's very small. So as ethnographers, ethnographers studied the different groups of hunter-gatherers across this region, their diversity became clear, as did remarkable cultural and material continuities between the more forest-orientated groups, despite their widespread borrowing of languages from their farmer neighbors. This provoked one prominent ethnographer called Serge Bauchet to label this the pygmy paradox. Given the significance that most people attribute to language as a key marker of, identi of identity, it seems paradoxical that these hunter-gatherers can adopt languages from their farmer neighbors 
but remain distinctively pygmy. Here, I suggest a way of explaining this paradox on, uh, based on understanding these different groups as constituting a civilization. Although a civilization as classically described by Dumont for India is typically understood as a hierarchical order that encompasses societies and peoples into its moral code, aesthetic standards and valued practices. Here, I present a civilization that considers hierarchy to be barbaric. And this is in the language of civilizations. You have the barbarians on the extreme and the civilized uh, in the interior. So it's reversed in this sense that it's hierarchy that's barbaric. And they incorporate these Central African societies. They incorporate other cultural groups as ritual dependents and consider the forest as the civilized space, whereas clearings such as rivers and farms mark the dangerous peripheries of this civilized central space. To propose that a civilization without hierarchy based on small scale groups living dispersed over a huge area of forest that can exist over long periods of time may seem unlikely. But here I want to argue that this civilization maintains order and coherence, most notably through shared musical practices, but also through an ideology of blood that determines proper sharing and a set of optimal adaptations to the material constraints of living well in this forest. Uh, but doing so without identifying individuals with authority to enforce traditions or judge or reject, reject innovations. And, uh, and this is a, something that's very difficult for a lot of people who've come from hierarchical civilization or uh, societies to understand that you can actually have systems that repeat themselves over time without the need for that overt instruction for judgment for uh, people who determine, yes, this is correct and this isn't correct. <clears throat> These shared practices cultivate an aesthetic sense that makes people, that, sorry, that makes appropriate behavior feel right rather than because it's imposed by people with authority. Perhaps because they guide behavior in mostly unspoken ways, such as such means of inculcating conformity and transmitting culture have far greater duration over time than modes that are based on elite power. Elite judgment and enforcement with its concomitant inequalities that are common in hierarchical civilizations provoke resistance, rebellion and conflict that eventually cause their fall. In reflecting on what makes society sustainable, these egalitarian Congo Basin hunter gatherers illustrate the force of soft power by charming their members to follow cultural patterns because of an aesthetic sense of what is good and right that is grounded in practices celebrating joy, laughter, cooperation, sharing, and beauty. Estimates of the overall numbers of contemporary Congo Basin hunter-gatherers range from about 200 and odd thousand to about 900,000. They're composed, and the reason for this is because, of course, nobody has ever tried, uh, been able to count these communities and the, the uh, uh, um, governments of these regions just neglect and marginalize these, these people and they're not interested in them. Um, they're composed of groups speaking different languages from Bantu, Ubangian, Central Sudanic traditions. Oh, sorry, language families, and today they practice a range of subsistence activities from hunting and gathering to fishing, farming, entertainment, salaried employment, day laboring and begging. They occupy different territories and have a range of different relationships with the far their farmer neighbors, belonging to diverse ethnic groups. Contemporarily, they are differently affected by the global forces of development, market expansion, conservation, logging, mining, plantation economies and in some places chronic armed conflict. Over historical time, contacts between hunter-gatherers and group, uh, hunter-gatherer groups and farmers have been very unevenly distributed in time and space, and they've always been partial since the numbers of people have been so small, the expanses so vast, and pop population densities so low. Today, there exists great variation in, in hunter-gatherer relations with farmers. Many twa in Rwanda over in the east uh, and Burundi are now, the la are now landless squatters and vassals of agricultural groups who've occupied their ancestral forests and covered them in plantations. Central Twa and Rua groups in DRC are losing their forest to rapid in-migration by farmers fleeing armed conflict in the east of DRC. Bakker in Cameroon are increasingly being forcibly sedentarized and forbidden to access good forest for hunting and gathering. 
Zimbangeli I lived with in Congo, successively established and broke off relations with three pharma groups in the 25, 30 years I've known them. They explained to me that at first the farmers are generous and friendly, but as time goes by, they become increasingly dependent on Mbengeli labor. And as their dependencies increase, their techniques become more coercive and discriminatory techniques for securing Mbengeli labor. And so the Mbengeli abandon them and find other farmers. There's evidence from early colonial times suggesting that this, in the past, uh, when forest was more accessible, this was a more typical pattern of interaction between the farmers and the hunter-gatherers. All define themselves as current or former forest hunter-gatherer specialists and recognize their shared ancestry as the indigenous people of Central Africa. They still participate in polyphonic music, despite significant differences in types, amounts and varieties performed. So some communities use uh, pipes to do polyphonic pipe music, other communities still sing polyphonically, and some focus much more on polyrhythms through drumming and xylophones in some cases. Um, their musical differences are loosely proportional to their degree of sedentarization. So the more acculturated into farmer and neighboring societies these hunter-gatherers become, the less they sing polyphonically. And I think that that's a, a very significant uh, uh, observation. In this talk, I'm going to focus on those groups still engaged in forest hunting and gathering for the insight it provides on the continuities underpinning this civilization. <clears throat> societies that are part of this Central African civilization share valued practices and that focus on hunting and gathering in a remarkably successful adaptation to forest living. This is evidenced by a distinctive material culture, the shared musical style, a moral ethos that rejects hierarchy, authority and accumulation as illegitimate, and an assertive egalitarian socio-aesthetic which is self-consciously cultivated and deliberate. Um, in addition to the huts or honey collection implements that you can see here, these groups share a range of material solutions for forest living that include particular axe styles, uh, honey uh, collecting methods and cli tree climbing methods, basketry and fiber rope techniques. Fiber ropes are a very important part of, of, of uh, their mystical tradition. Bark slings for carrying infants, bark ways of making bark cloth uh, for, for clothing, uh, and also raffia for clothing, and body decoration practices that include plant-based jewellery, plant dyes and scarifications. These commonalities identify forest-dwelling hunter-gatherers across the basin and are evidence of a highly resilient, resilient and successful forest adaptation. Newcomers are incorporated into their forest-orientated civilization in ways that provide the hunter-gatherers with opportunities for obtaining goods and resources or wealth that are available on the peripheries or from outside the forest, iron, salt, and various other things uh, being very important uh, uh, goods for these hunter-gatherers. <clears throat> As first inhabitants, they control newcomers' access to the mystical powers of the forest and the land. Since a chief's power, so the, high, the farmers, incoming farmers have chiefs and hierarchies, since the chief's power is based on his ability to bless and to curse, it's vital that the hunter-gatherers publicly bestow these powers on him if he's to claim to be a chief. And it's very uh, clear right across the region that big men and chiefs always try and find hunter-gatherers who will come and bestow on them this authority because it's, it really is where their authority lies. Mobutu Sese Seko, the former dictator of DRC when it was called Zaire, he used to, whenever he would go and visit a particular part of Zaire, he actually had two aeroplanes, one for himself and his small group, and one for a big group of pygmies who would arrive before him at the airport, so that when he arrived and he got off his aeroplane, he was being greeted by singing and dancing pygmies, and it was vital to his projection of, of power uh, in DRC, and, and he, he was an extraordinarily resilient leader uh, for, for, the, uh, for, the, for the country. Um, in effect, the newcomer's social order requires the hunter-gatherer's ritual services for vital ceremonies, such as in these enthronement rites for chiefs, or later as their court jesters once they were there, someone who would really speak truth to power. And as the suppliers of high status forest produce, such as leopard skins and other skins, and ivory that are central to the symbolism of chiefly power. 
The newcomers' lives are dependent on these hunter-gatherers, from special assistants as fertility advisors, healers, and midwives that enable, uh, enable newcomers to reproduce. These hunter-gatherers perform all the major life cycle rituals, such as circumcision, initiation, funerals, and the important lifting of mourning ceremonies that reinstitute the social order some years after a death. In other words, the hunter-gatherers are central to the reproduction of the newcomers' societies. To illustrate this civilization, I'm going to focus on the ethnography of the Bayaka groups living in Western Central Africa. The Bayaka are comprised of Baka, Mikaya, Luma, Aka, and Mbenjele, and they speak both Bantu and Ubangian languages. I've conducted extensive field research with the Mbenjele for the past 30 years and have spent time with many of the other groups too. These Western groups, along with the Eastern Swa, Aswa, and Efe in the Aturi forest, are the most forest orientated today and provide the clearest insight into the core practices of this non-hierarchical civilization. Acidic soils and tree root growth disrupt potential archeological sites unpredictably in this region. And this undermines, uh, this result has resulted in a very underdeveloped archeology span in the Congo Basin. Though there are, of course, interesting exceptions. Recent genetic studies provide uh, great insight into the deep past. After diverging from non pygmies between 110 and 70,000 years ago, and so those groups are the San peoples of the Kalahari, the Hadza of uh, East Africa, and then the pygmies, those and, and the Bantus diverged, carried on around the forest as opposed to entering into the forest. And the, the, pro, uh, the early pygmy groups went into the forest. So between 110 and 70,000 years ago, they moved into the forest. And Fan and his colleagues calculate that the Eastern Mbuti and the Western Bayaka pygmies diverged approximately 44,000 years ago. So older than is described in this picture. The reduction in forest cover during the last glacial maximum between 30 and 12,000 years ago consolidated the isolation between Western and Eastern ancestral pygmy populations, concentrating them in forest refuges and producing the degree of genetic and cultural diversity observed between them today. <clears throat> As the forest grew again from 12,000 years ago to 3,000 years ago, the isolated hunter-gatherer groups moved out from their refuges, the forest refuges they'd been inhabiting, to populate the regions we find them in today. The arrival of agricultural peoples from 5,000 years ago, but particularly from 2,800 years ago, created a second period of isolation between the hunter-gatherer groups. The arrival of farmers intensified from 2,800 years ago, and fragmented their hunter-gatherer populations because it occurred in conjunction with a climatic crisis that caused the contraction of forest into refuges separated by vast zones of more arid savanna. Um, while acknowledging this history and diversity, my focus here is on what they have in common. One of the most striking examples of a shared trait is their unusual singing style a highly integrated, non-hierarchical, choral, yodeled polyphony composed of multiple intermingling melodies. So when, when people sing polyphony, you, you can't all sing the same thing. In fact, everyone has to sing a slightly different melodic module and they interlink with one another to create a, a sort of grander, greater song that travels above. Um, and, and this is a very peculiar and unique form of singing, which is common to the San in the Kalahari, to the pygmies of Central Africa and also to the Hadza. And has been, some people think is the sort of archaic form of human music. Um, the spirit play rituals that are associated with this musical style are transacted across international boundaries between Bayaka groups that speak different languages. So they, they understand this system so well that even though they speak different languages, live in different countries, they will come and, and, and transact these ritual uh, the right to perform these rituals between themselves. So just so you get a sense of what it sounds like, I'm going to play this. Um, I'm only going to do it on one side, sorry, uh, for you guys on Zoom, just because it will create too much uh, interference, but you'll hear it.
So despite different languages and their dispersal in small camps or settlements for much of the year, members of these different Bayaka groups, notably young people, visit other Bayaka groups to establish friendships and meet potential spouses, to explore beyond their normal areas, as well as to participate in commemoration ceremonies, where they may be initiated into the other group's spirit plays associations. This freedom of movement is facilitated and made possible precisely because these hunter-gatherers share so much. This includes their egalitarian political ideology, a mimetic and predatory approach to languages, so they're constantly listening to the languages of other people and where they find a word they like, they take it and they incorporate it into their own speech. People change their names through life. If I meet somebody whose name I like, I say to my friends, right, call me by that name now, and then people will call me by that name. There's a flexibility in language, which uh, you know we're, we're not very familiar with here. And I think it's partly because we're so similar to the people around us. So the French and the English, you know, pretty similar and identical. Mm -hmm. So what do they focus on to mark their difference? Well, they focus on language and the food they eat rather than seeing all these continuities and similarities between them. Grande Bretagne, Great Britain says it all, I think, if you know that there's a small area of France called Bretagne, where certain Frenchmen came over to this country from. Um, so, the, um, so a mimetic and predatory approach to language and outsiders, a ritual and religious system based on the forest and this polyphonic music, a set of taboos driving gender division, the gender division of labor, premised on keeping menstrual blood, the blood of human fertility, apart from the blood of killing animals. A dynamic uh, and dynamic gender relations in which each gender is primed and learns to undermine special claims to status by the other gender. A rich sung fable storytelling tradition, an economic ethic focused on sharing, immediacy and the superiority of wild food and a similarly broad binary classification of people into forest people and village people. I use the label civilization over cultural area because those who are part of a civilization are explicit about their connections and aware of their cultural continuity. An example of this occurred in 2010 when I played a recording of Mbuti music from the eastern side of the forest made by Colin Turnbull in the 1950s to Mbengeli on the western side of the forest all over a thousand miles away. Almost immediately, within a few seconds, they said, oh, they must be Bayaka to sing like this. In the following, I want to explore why Mbengeli should so quickly and strongly identify with Mbuti musicking. Why should music be so emblematic of this civilization? To answer that question requires a bit more background. So I just want to start with the political context. Mm. Those ladies love to sing. They've just been singing for 10 hours before that piece of film was taken. It was in the morning after an all night session. Um, amazing energy. While a member of such a society might achieve inequality from time to time by hunting more than others, by being more charismatic or beautiful or persuasive and so on, a range of practices assure that such inequality cannot last for long. We call them leveling mechanisms and they include things like demand sharing. As soon as you see someone with something that they're not immediately consuming, you ask for some of it and you take it and it's not their right to refuse, it's your right to, to, to help yourself. Um, there's, of course, conventions and politeness involved, but uh, it's pretty strong. Uh, avoidance. So rather than if you have an argument with somebody or someone says something you find particularly offensive, you don't need to confront them. You can just avoid them. You haven't got anything to protect. There's no farms to, you know, that you depend upon. Uh, so you can just leave. Um, mockery, extremely important in these societies. And the great experts are elderly women who uh, have the right to really explicitly mock people who do outrageous things. Um, and, uh, and because they're elderly women, they're somehow, the, the, although they're touching on very tense emotions and, and strong feelings in people, because of their status as elderly women, the mothers of everybody, uh, they somehow are able to get away with it in, in ways which men can't do. If men start to do that, it very quickly causes fights and, and, and big problems. Whereas when these elderly women do it, they somehow, lots of humor in a very loving and caring way, um, but very precise and accurate. Uh, uh, they, they will teach people what they're doing wrong. Um, also, easy access to lethal weapons. So 
Uh, the fact that there are poisoned arrows lying around in camp mean that even if you're a, a very weak uh, uh, old lady and you're being bullied by a very you know, uh, big man, uh, if he falls asleep and you chuck him in the butt with, your, with the poisoned arrows, that really is it for him. And, uh, and so th that's, of course, I've never seen it done. It's never happened. But just the possibility of that happening acts as a certain restraint on excessive behavior. And the fact that you might have more brawn than someone else doesn't mean that you can dominate them because there are other ways that they could hurt you. Um, yeah, and so lots of practices also reject dependencies. Uh, so the idea that uh, you can force your child to do things is unacceptable. So as soon as a child can walk, they can decide where they sleep. So if a parent is unpleasant to their child or in, in other ways unpleasant to their partner, for instance, the child can just decide, no, I'm, I'm not sleeping with you anymore and go and sleep with a grandparents, go and sleep with a cousin or with a friend or with an auntie. And, uh, and that acts as a big incentive to, for parents to be actually very nice to their children and not do all this domineering stuff that is so common in authoritarian societies. <laughs> Um, and, and I think it's, 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 it's very powerful uh, training for those children. Uh, everyone has direct and unmediated access to the resources they need for life. So there's no way that I can tell somebody they can't go and exploit something that they want to exploit. It's really up to them to, to do that uh, if they so wish, and there's no one that can prevent them. Uh, the skills that are required to exploit these resources are, in general, widely available. So everybody from about the age of 11 or 12 is able to survive autonomously if they should want to. Of course, it's not so much fun to survive by yourself. So people stay in community and they share the things that they produce. Um, but, but everybody has the key skills they need for survival. There are certain skills which men in particular don't like to share with women because we appreciate that women like meat. So we don't want to give away all our secrets of how we kill animals, particularly the big ones that uh, have lots of fatty meat, uh, which is very popular with women so that they keep coming back to us for meat and honey, in fact. So we keep those secrets to ourselves and we only discuss them in particular areas uh, called Njanga, which are, are secret places, sacred secret places. Um, <clears throat> And everyone's free to move as they wish. So in the society, there's no word for goodbye. You don't say goodbye. If you say anything when somebody leaves, you say go. And, and the reason is, is that if goodbye is in a sense, it's like sticking a hook in someone and saying, I'm going to miss you, come back. And, and, and that's just not acceptable in these contexts. If someone wants to leave and go somewhere else, they, there's no right or ability for anybody to say, no, you mustn't go. And, and in some cases, if someone's going out to gather or, or going to hunt, and if you say something that resembles anything like a goodbye, it can cause fury from the person going out because they will interpret it as you trying to curse them or somehow uh, cause them problems when they're in the forest later. So, uh, you know, there are all sorts of practices we take. You never say thank you, for instance. You know, there really is no word for thank you. If you take something, you just take it and consume it. And, and that's enough. So these practices are actively cultivated and imposed on individuals assertively. Such groups are actively fashioning their worlds in similar ways that ensure that natural differences between people are not culturally converted into differences in status, authority, or rank. So granted, people are different. There's no question about it. People have different skills. They have different abilities. Um, but it's whether you culturally convert those differences into status, authority, or rank which is what these societies refuse to do. They act, actively reject. And even someone who's a good hunter will be discouraged from hunting if they're going off hunting too much, because that's a sign, well, why are you trying to make us all dependent on your hunting? No, no, let other people go hunting now. You go and find some honey or, or sit, look after the children for a bit. Um, so, I mean, just as an example, uh, a very good friend of mine, uh, he was actually my initiation sort of uh, uh, guide through the, the whole religious system of the Bambangeli, Fata. Uh, a lovely man, extraordinary storyteller, great elephant hunter, remarkable healer, um, but in his old age has become very partial to a tipple. 
and uh, in fact has become a rather uh, uh, serious alcoholic. And uh, whenever he sees me, of course, one of the things he's fishing for is some drink. And, uh, and I went to, back to the camp in 2019 and uh, we were, I'd just been there a few days. And when I arrive, some of the alcohol sellers from the Bantu communities, the farmer communities like to arrive to start selling their wares because they're sure that the white man's got money and then people will be able to get drunk and pay uh, for the alcohol. So um, the lady was, was sat down with her bottle of alcohol and Fatou had taken me, ah, oh, come on Jerome, let's have a drink for old time's sake. And, and I was all the usual tricks I have for deviating and avoiding uh, buying him alcohol. Um, I mean, I, I have to give in at some point or other, but you have to make it last a bit, <laughs> it gets too chaotic. And, uh, uh, and uh, so he sort of gave up with me, I wasn't being, and he noticed that down by where the canoes come and, and land uh, by the, the riverside, they had, a new guy had come who'd heard that there was the white man in, in the camp and was just curious to come and do a bit of tourism and see what this white man was up to. And uh, as soon as Fatah saw him, shoom, he knew there's my opportunity. And in the, and so he grabbed the, the man under the arm and started walking him up the central area of the camp. Say, I'm the big chief here. Everyone here, look at them. They're all my, uh, my, my subjects. Uh, I'm a big king of the forest here. And, and the reason what, what he was doing was he was playing to the expectations of the farmer, which is when you arrive in a new place, if the farmer is, uh, uh, chief is there as a sign of respect, and uh, conviviality, you buy the chief a drink. It's, a, it's a, just a practice which is considered normal. And so Fata was actually hauling this newcomer who was sort of looking around a bit, not sure what to do, but couldn't really resist the enthusiasm and charisma of Fata, uh, was hauling him across the village and he sort of saw me and passed by him. And Fata was speaking in Lingala, which is the lingua franca uh, of the region. And there were three little boys just playing in the sand. They were just fiddling around doing you know nothing much under 10 and one of them looked up as Fata was dragging the the farmer along and he said he's just a drunk he's an idiot don't believe him and uh, in Lingala so that the guy could understand and I could see on the guy's face this lack of how could this little boy speak so rudely about this old man who seems so important he's a big chief here and 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 this and, and Fata just come on don't think about it and just the banter continued and continued to, to, and of course he got to the lady and he got his drink and, and it was all successful. <laughs> so any form of ranking is teased, insulted, rejected, avoided, shared out or otherwise leveled off. Practices, practices that result in differential outcomes such as hunting are carefully handled by a combination of popular vigilance and ideologies of taboo that underpin the insightful principle that continued resource abundance is assured by correctly sharing with all present what has been produced. And in contrast to the endless rubbish that we hear from our politicians here, in these societies, there's no pressure to produce. There's no special reward for producers. The fact that you don't reward producers does not stop people producing. It's fun to do stuff. We don't like just sitting around all day long. People like to do stuff. You don't have to constantly reward them for doing it. But in these societies, there is huge popular pressure to share anything that is produced among all present. And that is where the pressure comes to bear on people's activities. So sharing is done on demand. Such sharing is not based on generosity, which is a quality of the donor, of course, but on the right of the demander to get what is not being immediately consumed. The donor has no right to refuse the demand. Should they refuse, they're immediately subject to mockery and ridicule. And if they persist, to people just abandoning them, they'll leave them, they'll, they'll go elsewhere. Demands for a share are imposed on the producer by the group with such insistence that it's impossible to ignore. Individuals may try and hide produce they don't want to share, but others will be suspicious and insistently demand from them or trick them into revealing what they have hidden in order to take some of it. This is assertive egalitarianism. There are no age grades, no gerontocratic principle, no gender inequality, no recognized leaders, no status positions, in some, no hierarchy. Bayaka and other pygmy groups implicitly recognize the significance of this political difference by distinguishing with generic ethnonyms between the forest people, such as themselves, and Bilo, who are the status-obsessed village people. 
While Bayaka groups recognize their common descent from the first forest dwellers, a shared history, this sung fables and oral tradition, their ritual and singing styles, and they intermarry, they do not trade group goods with each other. They do not trade goods with each other. They simply demand them from one another. By contrast, Bayaka people's relations with the Bilo village people are predominantly based on reciprocity, trade, and the exchange of goods. Bilo also means uninitiated. So Bayaka provide them with their ritual services. Rivers divide the territories of different Bayaka groups, so they do not overlap. However, Bilo territories are superimposed on top of Bayaka land claim, uh, on Bayaka forest. Bayaka sea forest cover as homely, peaceful and safe and contrast this with clearings such as villages or large rivers that are hot, unpredictable and potentially dangerous. And I often asked, I well, often, I uh, asked a couple of times the elders, you know, why is it you put up with these below claiming your forest as their own? And they said to us, well, in fact, you know, they're, well, the way I would translate this in English, they're nomadic, we are the sedentary people. And this, of course, flies in the face of how outsiders interpret. They call the villagers sedentary and the, the hunter-gatherers nomadic. But actually what the bikers say is, look, we stay in this area of forest. We, we know it intimately. We know when the different trees are ripe for fruit. We know where the animals will go to find their treats. And, and we can make a good living. We always stay in this area of forest. Whereas those below, uh, we've watched them, they come, and then they go. And of course, the history of migrations of these farming communities through the region is, is, is of you know, a lot of movement. They have moved huge amounts over time. And the Bayaka watch this and they say, look, you, we're the ones who stay here. We're the sedentary people. You lot are the nomads, not us. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So Benjeli consider the, the status and property obsessed Bilo in their region to be reborn as gorillas, because like gorillas, they fight for status, power and authority between themselves, and they make aggressive efforts to claim parts of the forest as their exclusive property. In normal speech, Bilo are simply referred to as gorillas because of this. Europeans are called Red River Hogs due to their extraordinary accumulation of wealth, in this sense, fat, um, despite sharing the same forest as everybody else. By using the forest world to incorporate these more recent arrivals, implicit evaluations are made about their habits and practices that mirror similar evaluative practices of outsiders by other civilizations. Animal labels cast these newcomers as prey and make deceit, trickery, and the application of hunting techniques in order to get goods from them legitimate. Uh, in, so one of my friends is Sakola. Uh, we were in a particular village having a big series of ceremonies and it was getting really messy because there were a whole bunch of the farmers who kept arriving with new amounts of alcohol to generate debts basically so that they could then get labor on their fields afterwards. And it was causing mayhem and a lot of fighting and violence and problems in the community. And I said to uh, my friend Isakul, I said, why do you put up with this? You know, it's causing so much trouble. And he said, look, when I go elephant hunting, I'll find my elephants. And I'm following my elephants. And I'm following my elephant. And then suddenly it has a big shit. And I pick up that shit and I have to smear it on myself. And as I smear it on myself, I become invisible. So that when I get really close to that elephant, I can go right up next to him and I'll be able to get my spear in and kill him. Well, it's the same with us, with these farmers. You know, we just have to put up with all this shit in order to get close enough to get the things we need safely. Um, indeed, just as the hunter-gatherer goes for the biggest pig in the sounder or the biggest elephant in the herd, so Bayaka target the wealthiest and most important outsiders from whom to extract goods. Thus, they readily associate themselves with big men, with chiefs, and today with presidents and ministers. So one of the few tarmac roads in southern Congo that went from the capital into the forest went directly from Brazzaville, the capital, to a community of Babongo pygmy hunter-gatherers who were very famous for their divination and other mystical skills. And the ministers and presidents would go and consult them when they needed a bit of extra help in their decision-making. Um, so I've, in, in other work, I've presented how a uh, Bayaka taboo complex called Aquila secures proper sharing within the forest cosmos. 
Through a complex of prohibitions, Aquila defines how the body's vital forces, reproductive potential, moral and personal qualities, emotions, and forest produce should be shared so as to ensure that group members experience good health, unproblematic unpro childbirth and child rearing, an abundance of food, and a convivial, pleasant atmosphere in the camp. The Mbuti and the Efi in the Aturi forest refer to similar taboos as Ekeri, and in linguistics, R's and L's uh, slide into one another very easily, and so it's essentially the same word. These taboos take advantage of the extent to which human bodies develop in fundamentally the same way to provide a framework for cultural knowledge to bind onto. This system of bodily mnemonics seems designed to provoke curiosity. In often surprising and sometimes counterintuitive ways, Aquila taboos link together sex, menstruation, blood, hunting, food, and exchange relations between people and between them and the rest of the forest. Aquila practices lead men and women to use their bodies in very different ways and to cultivate different styles of behavior, determining, for instance, whether as men, they stalk silently through the forest or as women, they sing noisily and, and walk in big groups with lots of children playing and fooling around about them to ward off the dangerous animals. No individual or institution is responsible for teaching about Aquila, rather the diverse prohibitions exert an anonymous but pervasive pedagogic action prompted by the natural curiosity they provoke in those subjected, subjected to them. For example, very young children are very interested in food, they will be curious to see that their mothers don't eat Aquila animals, but will prepare them for other people to eat. A brother, as he grows up, will learn that his menstruating sister is Aquila, and while she sleeps in the same hut as him, he cannot go far into the forest for hunting when she menstruates. And these things just provoke you, why should that be? And, and it's that uh, slow uh, contemplation of why that should be which leads to the acquisition of all sorts of other areas of cultural knowledge. A newly married couple must stop eating popular and tasty game animals such as blue diker. Blue diker are really easy to catch because you can call them to you. Meow, meow, meow. They come running out to you and so you can spear them or, or, or catch them. And so it's a very reliable source of food. It seems counterintuitive that a young married couple who really need as much nutrition as they can get um, should omit, uh, should not eat that. The reason is, is that when blue dikers are running away from something that they fear, they look behind them and they, they twist their neck back. And uh, the, 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 the claim is that uh, if you eat the blue diker and you're pregnant, your baby will look back. And of course, that's what we call a breach and uh, can cause severe complications in childbirth. And so the Aquila taboo of not eating blue dikers has a logic which fits in with people's understanding of other areas uh, of knowledge. So as they mature, girls and boys discover aspects of Aquila beliefs pertaining to the cosmologies of reproduction and women's secrets or to hunting and men's secrets. Bourdieu emphasized the efficacy of inculcating inequality and hierarchy by suggesting that if a culture is embodied in such a way, in such ways that it is almost beyond the grasp of consciousness, the hierarchies cannot be questioned. By passing from practice to practice without becoming explicit discourse, habitus remains unchallenged. Aquila is an example of a similar process inculcating egalitarianism. Key meanings and moral sentiments can be durably and effectively transmitted tacitly because they're embedded in inevitable sensory experiences connected with bodily maturation and everyday actions rather than being conveyed by instruction and verbal exhortation. Aquila's non-linguistic aspects make it difficult to articulate explicitly, but also difficult to manage by authority. Instead, it works by hidden persuasion, by provoking curiosity and stimulating each new generation to discover egalitarian ethics for themselves. As the Mbengeli hinted on recognizing Mbuti singing earlier, Another remarkably resilient non-linguistic way this pygmy civilization transmits itself across space and time is through music.
Bayaka groups hold up this musical form, the ritual performances of spirit plays and forest skill, rather than language as the key indicators for judging the extent to which other people are forest hunter gatherers like themselves. This emic focus on ritual performance is indicative of some of the key mechanisms through which this egalitarian civilization fashions those who are part of it into a particular cultural style without recourse to hierarchical structures or positions of authority. Although a minority of these spirit plays are gender exclusive, mo the majority include both women and men participating together. The basic structure of spirit plays, which involves both sexes, mirrors the gender division of labor, so reinforcing Aquila's underlying principle that a life of plenty is best achieved <clears throat> by the structured combination of gender differences and gendered production. In spirit play, men call the spirit out of the forest to the secret Njanga area and prepare it to dance. Women entice it out of the secret area and into the human space by their beautiful singing and seductive dancing, so enabling the whole community to delight in the joy the spirit brings. This gendered pattern of interaction resonates with gendered production in other areas, such as making children or eating dinner. According to folk biology, a man repeatedly gives semen to his wife for her to tie it up in her womb into a beautiful baby that she then returns to the man for her, uh, sorry, that she then returns to the man and his clan after birth and they give it a name. Or how the raw meat that men take from dangerous animals is cooked by women in order for it to be tasty and safely consumed to grow and sustain the camp. The principle seems to be that men bring things from the outside to the inside, women transform the thing once inside by making it beautiful and safe for all. The characteristics of this ritual system are shared across a range of pygmy groups speaking different languages and dispersed over Western Central Africa. And this facilitates an international network of certain spirit play associations right across the region. The ways that this musical style engages with the new reveal important qualities of such foundational cultural schema that are indicative of why they endure as tools for organizing how people engage with the world Michel Kislik, who's an, an ethnomusicologist, describes how Aka pygmies in the Lubai forest, just to the north of where I did my fieldwork, use musical performance as a way to explore modernity by adopting missionary songs and other music. Uh, over time, Kislik notes, they transform the new songs, such as hymns, by elaborating on a theme, a musical theme, until eventually it's engulfed in a flurry of kaleidoscopic improvisations, counter melodies and elaborations, effectively becoming increasingly acker in style. This constant embellishment, variation and recombination of the melodic modules occurs within their own music too, creating huge potential for variation each time a song is performed and leading to the creation of new musical repertoires and the extension of existing ones. Kislik refers to this underlying pattern as a distinctive Aka socio-aesthetic that orientates people to engage with new environmental stimuli in a dialogical way. Importantly for explaining its longevity, this musical style's deep structure encourages great variation and crea creativity every time a song is sung. In this sense, it manages to be conservative yet endlessly creative and innovative is not a rigid or dogmatic imposition, but an aesthetic orientation that drives sound into increasing complexity in a distinctive way. Key encompassing practices such as spirit plays provide structural guidelines for incorporating the new and giving it a distinctive biaka socio-aesthetic. Performing spirit plays structures small scale communities into large scale societies from the local to the regional level by ensuring that small camps dispersed throughout the forest come together to form larger gatherings from time to time. In the smaller social unit, the camp, spirit plays regularly bring the camp members together. Once in a while, they draw neighboring camps together for a special event, such as to celebrate an elephant kill or to console after a tragedy. In the dry season, commemoration ceremonies for those recently deceased bring people together in greater numbers than any other event and can attract members of neighboring Bayaka groups, sometimes coming from other countries. These Iboka ceremonies are the most important social events of the year 
at which marriages are arranged, initiation ceremonies occur, and news from the, across the forest is exchanged, and old friends meet up again, as do, of course, old enemies. This aggregation and dispersal of people over huge territories is organized and motivated by the social opportunities and the aesthetic pleasures afforded when performing spirit plays. <clears throat> and Benjeli say that uh, the beauty of spirit plays makes those who witness them go soft. Since they understand most living beings as having some form of sentience, music is very effective in pleasing them. Just as a people greet and ask each other, sorry, just as people greet and ask each other things for things as a sign of affection, uh, <clears throat> sharing sounds with the forest establishes a relationship of communication, of care and concern between the human group and the forest. Since people who care for each other share on demand, sharing song with the forest legitimates any demands people make so that the forest can be expected to share its bounty with people as wild yams, as honey, wild pigs or elephants. Participating appropriately in a polyphonic song <clears throat> composed of different parts sung by different people simultaneously is a political, psychological and an economic training as well as a musical one. Anyone can start or stop a song though there are particular conventions to follow. There's no hierarchy among the singers, no conductor or authority to organize participation. Each is free to choose which melodic lines they wish to sing. All must be present and give of their best. All must share whatever they have. This is a political education. Each singer must harmonize with others, but avoid singing the same melody as they do. If too many sing the same parts, the polyphony dissolves. So singers have to hold their own while resisting being entrained into the melodies being sung around them. If you try that when you're singing, it's difficult. This is a psychological education. Learning to do this while, when singing cultivates a particular sense of personal autonomy, one that's not selfish or self-obsessed, but to the contrary is keenly aware of what others are doing and seeks to complement this by doing something different. Musical skills prime participants to culturally appropriate ways of interacting with others. So the choices that each makes in, others, in, other, in other everyday activities do not need explicit justification since they're instinctive based on an aesthetic feeling of what, is, what one ought to do. And this is a key aspect of the unspoken grammar of interaction that is a central dynamic organizing daily camp life in a society where no one can oblige someone else to do something against their will. The musically acquired aesthetic predisposition to sing a different melodic line to your neighbors makes for an efficient hunting and gathering when it's transformed into an economic aesthetic. Do something different from other people. If everyone was to go hunting in exactly the same place and there happened to be no animals in that place, well, the camp's gonna suffer hunger. But if you decide to go there and you decide to go there and you decide to go there, well, there's a much better chance that we'll have something to eat. <clears throat> These are important reasons explaining why music and ritual are so preoccupying for Bayaka and other hunter gatherers when they want to know how like themselves another group of people are. The Bayaka implicitly recognize that performing these rituals and their accompanying musical repertoires has pedagogical, political, economic, social, and cosmological ramifications that serve to reproduce key cultural orientations they consider central to Bayaka personhood and cultural identity. They do so by seducing conformity through cultivating aesthetic sensibilities and an appreciation of harmony driven by our pleasure-seeking propensities. By being largely nonverbal, their music can resonate with multiple meanings. This flexibility is crucial to explain how this musical style has endured so long, adapting to changing circumstances and new situations by providing guidance, but not direction. Continuity, despite variation, and a means of ordering and making sense of novelty. <coughs> Sorry, in such a way. Can you just explain those two pictures there? Which ones? Uh, the, the one on the left and the one below. Okay, uh, the one on the left is a man doing what's called para cultivation. So when people dig wild yams, 
they don't just abandon the stalks, the, the, the stems that the wild yams grow under, they plant them back again. And what this does is it enhances the abundance of wild yams in their forest. And so uh, you get what are called dense wild yam patches, which are actually crucially important, not just for the hunter gatherers, but for elephants, gorillas, chimpanzees, and various other animals that love to eat these things. Um, so that's just an example of paracultivation. Um, down up here, we have some boys who are climbing up to do to collect some honey. And uh, just behind there, there's another hole in this, there are a few holes in this tree. You can see the lad is just there, he's blowing smoke into the hole. You can see the smoke's coming up here, and that's sending the bees away. So he's going to start sticking his hand in and, uh, and pulling out the, the honeycomb. Um, but it, anyway, th so hunting, honey collecting, and gathering. Just, you know, if you want to eat well, you need people to go and do those things. But if you can't tell people to do it, you know, it's much easier through this aesthetic predisposition to just do something different. Um, so the combination of constancy and structure and style with creativity and output offers a partial account of how this Congo Basin civilization has been so resilient. Their musical style frames the way people act and think rather than, rather than determining what they do or say, and so provides continuity in the context of change. Music's role in the cultural transmission of enduring aesthetic, economic, social, and political orientations is remarkable. The Mbengeli's immediate recognition of Mbuti as part of their civilization suggests this as do the genetic studies we looked at earlier, revealing that they've been separated for around 44,000 years. So in conclusion, I presented evidence suggesting a hunter-gatherer civilization encompassing the Congo Basin forest and its dwellers and those on its peripheries. The scale of this unconventional civilization is great, covering an area twice the size of Western Europe and boasting traditions whose core features go back over 45,000 years, and whose origins may lie over timescales that any other human civilization can but, marvel, can but marvel at. While location, language, ecology, technologies, and genes have changed, musical performance styles, mimetic or predatory language practices, blood-based prohibitions, and a forest hunter-gatherer economy have remained remarkably consistently associated. The material presented suggests that the association of a forest, forest hunter-gatherer lifestyle with a particularly egalitarian form of political, social, and economic organization, a gendered division of labor based on blood and oppositional gendered rituals, particular uh, and a distinctive musical style is enduring. It's not what repertoire people are singing, but the polyphonic yodeled singing style that they use not which dances they dance or which spirits they call, but the ritual structures they follow when doing so. Mm. Not the language they speak, but how it is spoken. The perception of what it means to be part of this pygmy civilization is based on an aesthetic quality in which structural style is shared rather than content. This is not a little tradition, despite the societies composing it living in small scale groups that are currently marginalized and discriminated against by contemporary modern states. They exhibit aspects of a classic great tradition in the way that they encompass their members and newcomers, evaluate hierarchical practices as immoral, barbaric and illegitimate, and even impose their ritual form on the lives and deaths of incoming groups. Here, the cleared domesticated spaces of farmers are peripheral, dangerous and unpleasant, while the civilized center is what we would call the wild forest. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's see if we can change the link here to um, change to the laptop and then we'll shoot what our backwards look so we can put you out. Maybe we can have some changes. So if somebody can use, if anybody's got any questions from the room, um, can we use the room? You got a big voice?
Can you hear it on Zoom? Can you hear on Zoom the question? Um, let's hear it again. Or let's hear the level of the volume. <laughs> we want to probably mark. Are you pick? Can you so speak again? Up. Is that switch? Can you hear me now? Can you hear you guys? No. Not really. No. Okay, no. we'll have to repeat no. it. Mm. I can hear well now. It's egalitarian within the civilization, but it seems to be. Um, hierarchical toward outsiders in the sense they instrumentalize them for things that they need and they trick them and they kind of concern them. So I'm how what your thoughts on are on those two sort of uh, traits. Yeah, that's a very good Can question. Repeat, so the question is that within this civilization, people are egalitarian in their relations to one another. But it appears from what I was saying, uh, or the question is, to what extent are they actually being hierarchical with these outsiders? That would have been quicker, actually. Um, and uh, and uh, are indeed. I will take this off. Yes, I'll, I'll just I'll turn it off. Hierarchical. My video. I don't want to see my video. I've just turned it off. But <laughs> Always a thing with Zoom. So um, actually, uh, they're not hierarchical with the, uh, the, their evaluation of behaviors is judgmental in the sense that they find these hierarchical behaviors unacceptable and you know, just you know, unpleasant. And, and uh, you know, just the, the way, for instance, when a, a, a person might beat their child, they find that absolutely outrageous or the neglect that some men show towards their, their families to their wives and children. Um, or, or the claims, you know, when someone comes along and, and does, you know, as my friend was doing in a, in a way of trapping, uh, entrapping the, 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 the farmer who came to see the, to do tourism uh, when I was in camp. Um, so, but when it actually comes down to, you know, sharing food, um, I was, for instance, one time in a camp, we, we'd been a period of quite some that we just hadn't been lucky hunting. And there was a commercial hunter who'd come to the camp and had bullets and a gun and he was landing it out and getting young people to go and shoot animals for him. And he had a, a smoking table where he was smoking this these antelope carcasses in order to uh, bring them back and sell them in, in the logging nearby logging town after some time. And uh, we had two or three days where there really wasn't much food and, and people were getting very hungry. And it seemed to me just an outrage that this guy was sitting there with all this meat and he was literally staying up all night to make sure people didn't come and just take bits off, off it. And I'm sure they did. Um, but uh, uh, the next uh, sort of a day or so later when we actually we killed an animal and we brought it back into camp and we shared it out with everybody, including him. I mean, or my, the friend who I was with also shared with him. So there's no question that when it comes to the, the sort of basics of these egalitarian practices, that they are not applied to outsiders because they come from these you know, barbaric traditions of, of hierarchy, inequality and, and, and hoarding, uh, even though they recognize these as being you know, unacceptable from their own point of view, they also understand that, well, that's how these people are and well, that's how they are. But so, so they're egalitarian in the sense that they will, uh, they will give the same uh, way that they are with each other to those outsiders, but that doesn't mean they haven't got a negative evaluation of the way the, the uh, outsiders are. Yeah, I'm quite skeptical for the, the, the seminar, uh, especially on the gender relations, given how complicated it is in our. You could say society civilization from the yeah. context to exist. Um, but it's, it's very, very interesting. And, and I kind of just wanted to ask a concluding question, comment that is basically the lack of the power relations uh, in an intrusive way in the society is what kind of permits for traditional gender roles to occur without causing uh, inequality in a sense. 
uh, because I still see that there's very like specific roles for women, specific roles for men, but that doesn't seem to be an issue among them. Is it because of the lack of women? Okay, so let me just uh, share your question. So uh, the questioner was asking about was skeptical that an egalitarian society could exist and was particularly skeptical in relation to gender and uh, or gender relations and so the question really was asking to what extent sorry are gender relations really egalitarian or no the power relations between genders how are they subsumed within this context of a division of labor well the first thing to say is that the division of labor is not uh, absolute so you know a woman who comes across an animal when she's walking in the forest collecting mushrooms will use whatever means she can to kill the animal in in fact though uh, she will avoid bloodletting because that's what men do when they hunt animals so she won't pierce the animal she'll use the back of her machete to knock it on the back of the head or she may pick it up and knock it against a tree but she will try and avoid piercing it and causing blood to let which is the male way of of bloodletting um uh, and similarly, a man who sees his wife struggling to finish a basket will join her and start doing a bit of basket weaving to, to help. So there's no sort of uh, intrinsic evaluation of these being better or worse and that men can't do things that women do and women can't do things that men do. Uh, you know, in any situation where it seems appropriate, people will do what, what's needed to, to maximize that situation. But um, just to return to your question about power, um, there is power among women and there is power among men but so the ritual system which uh, i think Morna finnegan has talked about last time did she uh, to some extent yes. but anyway yeah. um so th there are uh, you saw that photograph of all the women bound together as one group this is ngoku this is the main women's uh, uh, sort of sp or is one of the main women's spirits and when women dance that and sing those songs they take over the camp and men, we just sort of, you know, we go off. They, they, they embarrass us because they insult us, uh, particularly uh, elements of sexual performance that men sometimes don't master properly. And, uh, and it's a form of education, actually. They're, especially the young men, they're educating them about how to, you know, if you want to really please a woman, well, you need to think about this and you need to think about that. And they do enactments and, and it's very humorous and... Uh, and uh, and very effective so in effect what they're doing is they're showing they're teaching the other women the younger women in particular being taught by the older women where their power lies how you can bring a man down to size really quickly and the sorts of tools which women have and they explore them in these rituals uh, and then similarly when the men are doing some of their rituals they they in one for instance uh, called short they they arm over each other's shoulders and they dance up and down the central area of the camp and it's a very sort of loud stamping dance and when you've got 20 or 30 men stamping like that the earth is literally shaking and uh, and you feel their strength you feel their power and they're singing in these deep bassy voices and it, it really does evoke male power in a very powerful way and men and uh, women and children will sort of be in their huts looking out from the safety of the huts but feeling the earth shake as the men come by and there's a sort of uh, uh, uh it's, it's a frisson they call it in french it's it's something dangerous and uh uh you know a bit scary but but because it's your scariness they're the things that are going to protect you from those dangerous animals or from those brutish uh neighbors who come and try and exploit you so it becomes something that's, that's kind of nice because yeah my my, my men really are scary um, so uh, th th it's in complex ways that they play with the different power of gender, but without it being something which is deterministic of what you do. So um, cross-dressing, for instance, is, is part of the comedy of certain rituals. It's part of the way that you explore uh, you know, different ways of enjoying yourself and there's no appropriation. Uh, there's certain same-sex relationships that will happen. It's not something that's considered abnormal or weird. It's just, you know, part of the experimentation and, and experience of human sexuality. So um, it's, it's, there are very clear containers for these things, but they're not, uh, you know, in the sort of way we are about, you know, oh, well, it's just like that. You can only do this. Uh, they're much more practical and, and open-eyed about these things. Are you going to say more about more well, talk about well, yeah, the pendulum yeah, of example. power, but yeah, yeah. Um, is there any questions on Zoom here? And you need to unmute. There is, I think, Dor, you had your hand up. Do, 
door. Margarita. And um, that's Me Megan. Megan. Oh, Megan. Sorry. Megan, oh, can Megan, you unmute? Sorry. Can you unmute? Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, Jerome, I just wanted to say that I found your presentation absolutely thrilling. And I found myself sitting there and feeling that every single sentence that you uttered could be um, applied to the son of the Kalahari yeah. um, in my experience. I, 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 I felt right at home. And um, it was uh, particularly when you were talking about the dancing and the singing that I felt that there was the possibility of this huge uh, vision of a, of a larger civilization that you are discussing, uh, one that it exceeds forty five thousand years uh, in the in the area of the Congo, um, could be could be thought of in terms of the entire continent of Africa. Um, I, I was imagining. Um, bringing a group of Kalahari San people, for instance, to, um, uh, to singing that was, that was um, like that snippet that you played for us. And I can imagine that within minutes, if not seconds, um, the people would be singing together. They would be embedded in each other's musical traditions. It, it, would, it would happen with lightning speed, I believe. Anyway, so I don't have a question at mm. the moment. I just wanted to offer that appreciation. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Megan. That uh, means a lot to me coming from you. Um, and I think you're absolutely correct that uh, there is something about a greater sort of archaic civilization that uh, is somewhere deep in the in the past. And, you know, we we can just see these trace elements. And it is extraordinary that it is music in particular which uh, really does seem to communicate the deep sense of what that tradition is and, and how, how old it is. I mean, when you think that the uh, San and the Pygmies uh, split around 100,000 years ago, the fact that these two traditions are continuing with, of course, differences and, and variation up until today really is quite remarkable. And, and it does, uh, I mean, just put to shame what we've considered to be the great civilizations of our hierarchical world. Um, yeah, they're just spring chickens compared to this. And, uh, um, and what's very interesting is Victor Grauer, who was Alan Lomax. Alan Lomax was a, a very ambitious ethnomusicologist who created something called the uh, uh, Cantometric database, thank you, yes. So uh, he created a system for categorizing musical performances uh, in traditional societies around the world. And uh, his, his sort of main student was Victor Grauer. And Victor Grauer has just in the past 10 years uh, developed a theory where he, he really does connect these two styles and suggest that they are part of a very archaic tradition that uh, um, you know, we should pay much more attention to. So your feeling uh, is supported by others and particularly by ethnomusicologists. Um, there are some French ethnomusicologists who did a study of San and compared it with pygmy polyphony. And they found that the two styles were actually constructed rather differently, but in sonic uh, appreciation, they sound remarkably similar. And in, you know, from my point of view, it would be hardly be surprising that after such a huge amount of time, there will be some differences in the way that they produce this sound. But the fact that they produce such similar sounds really is quite remarkable and, and I think worthy of a much more detailed work uh, in the future. But thank you, Megan. Thank you. It's Anne. Anne McShane, do you unmute? Yeah, thank you. I put it in the chat, but... Um, what I was interested in asking Jerome about was the commitment of the uh, of the the tribe itself to the continuance of their way of life, um, especially when they're being put under pressure from the outside world, from farmers, etc., coming with things to sell and interrupting their the dynamic of their lives. So. Um, whether you could comment on that. And the second point in that is, because you said the men go outside and the women are normally inside, I wondered whether women were 
less prone to those pressures or perhaps more prone, more vulnerable in other ways um, from men that come from the outside. So those were those questions I asked, wanted to ask. Thank you, and it was brilliant. Thank you very much, Anne. Those are excellent questions. Um, so uh, the commitment to the continuity of this way of life, I think people are very committed, but uh, there are forces that are uh, larger uh, than them, which are now playing out in the forest. Um, for instance, conservation areas, the best areas of forests are now being carved off and given over to big international organizations who will exclude people, will kick them out of those areas in order to protect the animals. Um, and, and, you know, rather than blame the, the sort of way that our elite societies are consuming resources and damaging the biosphere. They focus on these very small characters and they're blamed for the loss of elephants or uh, rhino, not in our case rhinos, but in other places. But they're blaming the small people for problems which are actually created by much uh, larger systems, which uh, of course we are part of. Um, so things like palm oil plantations, rubber plantations, um, uh, logging areas, these are the sorts of big disruptors uh, in the lives of these hunter gatherers. And, uh, and you know, for many years I've been struggling in various ways to, to help people better represent themselves in these contexts of, of conflict. But the cards are so heavily weighted against them that uh, it really becomes very difficult for them to resist. And because they aren't organized hierarchically, uh, resistance is even more difficult because people will tend to rebuke or refuse to follow the agreements or decisions made by one member of their society and uh, and that means that they have great difficulty representing themselves to outsiders so yes their way of life is under a, a quite serious pressure but what's very interesting is even in the context of that pressure uh, they will apply some of the same processes that they apply within their own civilization to these outside forces. So one of my students, Catherine Townsend, she worked with a group of Baka who had lived in an extremely remote part of the forest until suddenly, uh, I think it was iron, a great stash of iron was discovered underground. And uh, an, uh, initially an Australian company, it's now a Chinese company, uh, decided to exploit the iron. And within, I think, two or three years, uh, they had completely cleared an area of about uh, uh, 2,000 hectares and established a, a small town where all their workers would stay and completely transformed the local area, a road now with uh, vehicles traveling regularly, bringing supplies and other things to the, to the mining town. And, uh, and the, the, the backer in her community started to want to try and discover how, how could they get there hands on, get shares of all this stuff that was suddenly arriving in their forest. And so one of the key ways they would do this is by uh, going to what are called what nightclubs. I mean, they're, they're basically shacks where someone has a generator, they wire up a, a sound system and they get beers and alcohol and sell it to people. And then of course, there's lots of dancing. And so what she noticed is that particularly the young men who saw that a lot of the newcomers were men, uh, and but weren't being offered jobs in the mining company because they didn't have the sorts of skills the mining company was after um would dress up in in you know uh, baseball caps and they would wear bling jewelry fake jewelry uh and dance the 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 rumba congo rumba style that was going on in the nightclubs and they were sort of somehow by imitating impersonating the uh, the people who were, were had all this stuff that somehow they might be able to find ways for themselves to get stuff too. Um, one of the negative consequences, particularly for women in this situation, was that that macho uh, sort of patriarchy that comes along with with uh, with a lot of those musical styles uh, was also something they experimented with. So there was much more domestic violence in communities there, particularly when people were drunk and some appalling domestic violence, actually, um, and, uh, and, and levels of drunkenness, which became completely dysfunctional. I mean, children neglected for days on end, not cared for and so on. I mean, really very serious problems. Uh, fetal alcohol syndrome is now a, a big issue in the region and so on. Um, and so, yes, uh, these new new phenomena are having a, a very powerful impact on people. Another thing which is transforming uh, their way of life is roads. Right previously, they controlled people's access to the forest. If you didn't have one of the hunter-gatherers to guide you as you walked 
from one place to another, you'd just be lost and, and finding food and all that kind of stuff, you'd be really suffering. So um, the hunter-gatherers could effectively control people. And there are a whole set of stories of people who went into the forest with a hunter-gatherer group, but were so horrible to the hunter-gatherer, they just abandoned them. That one morning they'd wake up in the middle of the forest and there'd be nobody there. And there's a, a rather, uh, well, it's, it's a bit annoying, but also quite amusing book by a couple of French explorers who uh, had done their military service, decided to go from down the, the river Sangha in a canoe and survive. Uh, and they stopped roughly nearby to where I did my field work. And actually one of my informants was there, uh, was the guy who led them into the forest, but they were so uh, you know, bossy and entitled and self-righteous and so on that after a certain amount of time, he just got fed up. He's called Tato and, and he abandoned them. And they have this book, it's called uh, Congo Jusco Coup, uh, Congo up to the neck. And they described how, you know, they had one pistol because they were military guys, uh, how they described how they ended up, you know, took them about a month to find their way out of the hospital, uh, out of the forest. One of them shot himself in the foot and various other <laughs> misadventures anyway. But uh, so th there are ways that they could control people's access to the forest and, and reserve it to, for those people they approved of. Um, but with roads, that's completely lost now. So anybody gets into the forest, commercial hunters, gold miners, traders uh, of all sorts. Uh, and that really does mess up the, their ability to control these spaces. So yes, there are big uh, uh, changes happening, not everywhere, it's a big forest, um, but women in particular are most vulnerable, I think, to the, uh, the negative sides of this. Chris. Yeah, uh, can people hear? Shout and Chris, yes. and Chris and yes. Jerome. I was interested uh, when you said the forest people uh, appropriate words from the farmers. Seems to me that there's a parallel here. It's not an exact parallel, but there's definitely a parallel between the Sami in the north of Scandinavia, mm. uh, who live next door to the Finns, and, and, and this 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 kind of relationship. Because the Sami apparently have a story that in the old days we were subject to an enemy tribe, which then imposed their language on us. Mm. And in, in fact, the Sami language is is very similar to Finnish. But the Sami are not Finno Ugrian by any manner of means; they are indigenous. Right. So uh, it's an observation, I presume. Yeah. 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 So the the observation about language appropriation was that the Sami uh, in Finland. Uh, have speak a language which is of Finnish origin somehow and they have a myth that they their enemies forced them to learn their own their language but uh, it's clear that they're not a Finnish people so there must be some sort of acquisition or language adoption or, or uh, appropriation that has gone on in the past um, somehow got used to it. <laughs> and, and people get used yeah. to it yeah and certainly with the case of the hunter-gatherers here, that does seem to be the case. People adopt the structures. What's very interesting is, so the group I know, the, the Bambangeli speak a particular Bantu structured language. So Bantu languages are characterized, for instance, by having the singular and uh, uh, plural at the front of the word as opposed to the end of the word as English does. Um, whereas Ubangian languages, they have the plurals and singulars marked at the end. So, uh, you know, really different structured languages. But when you get to the forest, and if you walk in the forest with either a member of these groups, you can more or less understand each other because there's about 80% uh, similarity in the forest vocabulary. It's just the, the structuring and the, the village vocabulary, which is, is remarkably different. So there are some very interesting things going on. And I think it's because this question of identity and language, you know, when your identity is so obviously different to the people who you're encountering, well, having a few words from their language or a structure from their language is no question of challenging your identity. You're just, we're hunter-gatherers, you're farmers, you're hierarchical and inegalitarian. We're, I mean, the differences are just so clear that the, the whole problem of identity doesn't come into it. You're not searching for these other markers. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. Um, can I ask, um, when yeah, you're of talking about uh, pregnancy and the woman giving a child, the baby, to a man's patrilineal clan. To give it a name. To give it a name. Okay, but the issue here is, um, generally speaking, in terms of residence patterns, there's a tendency of female from matrilocality. Is, is that so? Um, 
whereas there is also this imposition of patri clan affiliation. Um, how can we uh, kind of resolve the paradox there? Well, I mean, it, it doesn't really, it's not such a paradox in my mind. Um, the reason being, uh, you, you, so you get different things from your different uh, parents. Uh, and so mother lines give you something, it, it's basically called gundu. Uh, it's a, a substance which is your, your spiritual force, if you like. And some elements of your gundu come from your mother line and other elements come from your father line. And that's really who you are. Uh, you, you are associated with a clan which follows the Patri line, right. but uh, that's really for sorting out this business of incest. It's, it's not something which bestows particular power. There's no, I mean, there is always a, a guardian of the clan who has responsibility for the forest spirits that that clan is a guardian of, but uh, there's no real sense of, uh, it, it's a belonging as opposed to an ownership or a, a structure of hierarchy. Um, so the, the, the name is just, you know, there's a body and then there's a name. So it, the two things make a person enter the community. Um, it's, so, and then for the question of matrilocality, um, that's certainly true in the early stages of, of a marriage. But once it's established and children are walking, it's very common for people to go and hang out with their friends. And, you know, there is an ideal sort of thing. Oh, it's when you're both your mother-in-laws are happy to live together and they're not <laughs> arguing and rowing with uh, you or, or yeah. themselves. And, and, and then you're in your camp with your mates and with your other family yeah, members. And then that's really the ideal. But of course, it's not always like that. And mother-in-laws aren't always easy. Yeah, well, that, that would be similar to my cancer as well. But that system of so door. Who's door? Yeah. Hi there. You need to. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Uh, Great to hear you. Uh, oh, and to see uh, you. Very nice. <laughs> <laughs> nice to see you. Uh, well, I can't see you, but it's nice to hear you. Okay. Um, thank you very much for this, and and thank you for making this uh, lecture available for people on Zoom as well. It's really nice. Um, so, um, my question is about Bayaka um, musical culture. So. They have a very elaborate musical culture, uh, which was noted not just by uh, Westerners, people in Europe, uh, but also by their neighbors, I understand. Yeah. Um, they were hired regularly by big old outsiders for ritual purposes, right? Yeah. Um, so my question is, uh, I really want to learn more about that. I was wondering for what rituals, um, how frequent was it? Um, was it only men that were doing these sort of uh, um, ritual things? And I was also wondering, because they do have a really elaborate and very dominant musical culture, whether there is a kind of specialization going on there, which might be partly responsible for the dominance of music in their culture. Okay, well, that's a very interesting question. Um, so essentially, so the neighbors uh, asked them to come and do uh, all the important life cycle rituals. Um, and that really is the key. So circumcision, uh, uh, initiation ceremonies. Um, and it's it, so these the, the farmers cultures or societies are based on a system where uh, or Jane Geyer describes it very well, I think, as a wealth in people system. So the uh, the sign of someone being important and having status is not through their material acquisitions as it, is, as it is in, say, British society, but it's through the number of people that depend upon them. And so the more people that depend upon you, the more status you have in the eyes of others. And these are why they often call these big man societies uh, in Central Africa. So uh, part of the way that big men demonstrate their numbers of dependents is by not just you know, the people in their own community that depend on them, but by drawing in huge numbers of pygmies to come and sing and dance at their ritual celebrations. And it, it, you know, you can, I hear it you know, when I listen to elder uh, Bantu men speaking to one another you know, about the problems of getting enough pygmies to come to their whatever it is ceremony uh, so that they don't look like they're small men in the eyes of their neighbors. 
uh, and and it really is a big issue you know and they plan very carefully sharing resources with one another so all right well this time i'll give you some manioc because i know you'll need it next time you give me some and and trying to you know it really is complex and the benjeli will just suddenly stop singing you know after a couple of hours if they're not satisfied with the thing and the big man is then really struggling oh, what can i do what can i do i've got to get them they've got to keep singing otherwise i'll look like a nobody and uh, and you know we'll pull out all the stops and and, and there's a very skillful manipulation of this uh, competitive potlatching in a sense that the Bantu big men have to do in order to demonstrate that they really are truly uh, big men. Um, and it's very interesting that even in those archetypal, so sort of the god Bess, the qualities that uh, Bess is famous for really are uh, focused around music and dance, around these propensities that the, the, the pygmies here show. The business of controlling the fertility of the neighbors, uh, of bestowing the right to bless and curse on them. These are all things that are held within that, uh, uh, the image of Bess and the, the qualities of Bess as a god. It, it really is extraordinary to me that these symbolic elaborations uh, continue through time remarkably consistently, despite the, the huge amounts of time that have gone by. Um, now, uh, you can't get a really good uh, polyphonic chorus without women. Uh, particularly interestingly, it's the sort of young women or young girls from the age of about eight to uh, 20 or 18, who really are the motor of ritual performance. They, their voices are beautiful. They inspire everybody else. They have an energy which is just unstoppable sometimes. And, uh, and that's something that is really celebrated in these communities. Uh, and it's very often this, the sort of children between six and 13 or 14 who are the instigators of ritual performances within the camp. They get together, they start just you know, just having a bit of fun and then it develops into something beautiful. And then a few of the other adults around, oh, wow, that's really gorgeous. I'm going to sit down and join them. And then slowly everyone, ah, come on, let's have a masana, it's off. Uh, and everything goes. So when they perform for the outsiders, women and girls are a really key part of the uh, of, of the of the chorus uh, and very much involved. And the women will make their own separate demands if they feel, for instance, that the farmer is giving too much alcohol to the men. They'll complain, say, "No, no, no, we're not singing. You've got to sort us out properly as well." And uh, and so uh, they're very a very important part of the process. So Chris has a question. Sure. In answer to your previous point about gender. Do you want to maybe come forward then? Okay, yeah. Um, okay. Well, you were previously asked about uh, gender relationships and uh, so on. You were asked about gender relationships. And of course, the critics of the idea of hunting and being a gay, that, that sort of last stand is always, oh, yeah, but what about gender? Surely, you know, you've got to do this for ladies, and it's obviously. You know, only, only you know, women aren't allowed to hunt. But you, were, you when you said that women can hunt but mustn't use the uh, yes, uh, weapon to produce blood, can you perhaps say something about another thing which seems to be very important that we haven't mentioned? Which is, when it's a quite a big, um, quite an important animal, that the women actually manage the hunt. Yeah, yeah. it's called a women's hunt. Yeah. So, so that seems to be very significant. Yeah, well, sorry, there's, it's, it really is a very rich society, so is I do end up missing stuff. And thank you for reminding me, Chris. Um, so hunting, uh, you know, because we're very sort of instrumental in the way we think about production, you know, you think about who was the person who stuck in the spear as being the hunter. But actually, from a Benjeli perspective, that's not what's that part. I mean, it's not the easy part, but but it's not the most important part. The most important part is actually the relations that you have with the forest. And it's the forest giving you those animals. It's not you taking those animals. Um, you have to be smart. You know, you're not going to overpower an animal. It's not in the sort of Rain Wilderslev version of uh, Nordic hunting where the animal just stops, looks at you and says, you know, kill me. No, no, these Congo Basin forest animals, you know, you try and kill them while well, they're going to give you as tough as you give them. And you've got to really be wily and smart and, and not let them uh, overpower you. Um, and so the actual work of hunting is to persuade the forest to give you those uh, those animals. And women are the key uh, instigators of that relationship. They are the ones who charm the forest and this business of going soft. Um, so the beauty of their singing makes the forest go soft. 
And uh, I did mention this business of an exchange relationship. If you are communicating with somebody, then that means that you have a potential for asking for stuff, for, for demanding shares of what they have. And this is very much the ideology that underpins women's involvement in uh, in, in in hunting. So they will be the ones who sing out and, and charm the forest by their beautiful singing, opening it to the men's hunting activities. Um, the, the, the key thing, which is the uh, elephant hunting, is something which is uh, organized by women. So in the sort of very typical, I mean, obviously there are opportunistic elephant hunts, like you're walking in a forest and you come across an elephant, and if you're an elephant hunter, off you go. Um, but, uh, but in cases where it's planned, it's the women who will instigate it, and they will plan it. And they perform a particular style of song called Yili, which is the, uh, it, it's the, it's sort of the most elemental of their singing styles. It contains all the basic elements that all the other spirit plays then elaborate into different directions, but Yile holds them all as the hearts. And during Yile singing, women will drink a particular herbal brew and go into these trances, and it's a very distinctive trance where they, they sit like this, and certain women will, will fly off above the forest, and as they're flying above the forest, they look down and where they see animals, they then come down and they tie up the animals with a sort of, it's one of these fiber strings, it's a, a, a sort of mystical string. And then when they come back out of the trance, uh, they have, they, they use leaf whipping. Uh, it's a particular way of purifying things from bad luck. And so they purify all the, all the they purify the camp, they purify the uh, weapons of bad luck. And then they take all the leaves that they've been whipping against themselves and against uh, other things and they dump them on the roof of the elephant hunter who they want to go elephant hunting and and it's a very forceful uh, sort of uh, incitement to go and do this extraordinarily dangerous thing um uh, because you've got all the women in the camp just saying right you've got to go and, and they say right you'll find your elephant is over there by this particular <laughs> river or whatever it is and then the elephant hunt has to go and um you know it really is dangerous to hunt elephants it's terrifying <laughs> i mean these are huge animals they're really the skill the knowledge you need to combine together to do it safely is remarkable and uh, uh and and so it's, it's actually something you know some of my friends they say no no i'm not an elephant hunter Whoa, much too scary for me and uh, and there's no you know it's not something seen as bad it's just that's not my the qualities of my character um <clears throat> and so the women by regularly doing this yele they enforce the the duty of men to go out there and risk your life yes risk your life to get meat and bring it back to us here in camp uh, and and it and it works um sorry was that the right yeah you have never described that to me in such Detail. I was just going to further ask about these fiber strings symbolism and the importance because isn't there something corresponding with the sun with the sun in terms of threads and ropes and in terms of creation of relationships I don't know if Megan yeah maybe Megan can tell us um, but, it, but is there any sort of parallel in that you think well, um, I don't know the sand material properly, so maybe Megan can help us here. Um, it's certainly I, was, I was not able to hear the question correctly. Could you rephrase Sorry. it? And so I was I'm struck by uh, Jerome talking about symbolism of the uh, fiber strings, particularly when he talked there about Yele and the women using mystical strings to tie down animals. Um, and there are uh, accounts from Juntuasi, I do believe, about strings, threads to the sky and um, ropes linking people. And I'm just wondering if there is any kind of linkage, any kind of similarity between those. Well, I think I think they they both participate in what uh, the Juntuasi would would call num things, and which uh, are perhaps called is it Aquila or Enquila um, with Bayaka? Aquila, yeah. Aquila, mm -hmm. um, that uh, these are mysterious powers that um, uh, whose rules must be learned. And must be learned by by young people by asking questions. Well, why is it this way? And um, it is 
it, it is a sort of a goods to think with for both of them, learning, learning opportunities, and um, that they, they do have similarities in that they are, um, they allow people to perform certain things that are beyond human capacities, such as traveling on the threads to the sky. But um, I don't, I don't know of a separation that's made between men and women, if that's part of your part of your question here. Um, uh, for instance, you seem to have said that the, um, that, that the spiritual fibers used by women, by the, uh, by, by the Bayaka groups um, are, are uh, exclusive to women. Is that true? No, uh, there, it's, a, it's a general technology which uh, is used in healing, in uh, a whole range of mystical practices, from hunting to childbirth to toothache. <laughs> um, you know, they, they, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a vast area of knowledge which I'm uh, rather ignorant of uh, and is quite baffling in many ways to me. I, it's, it's one of those areas I really need to uh, study much more in detail. My wife Ingrid has done much more work on them as she was very interested in the healing system of the Bayaka. But they extend far beyond physical illness to cover all sorts of ritual and other purposes too. Well, that's also true of Mum um, with the Junklasi. Uh, both men and women have access to it. Um, and it, it there, there's not such a thing, as far as I'm aware, of men's Mum and women's Mum. Um, it's an undifferentiated sort of substance, rather like Aquila, as far as I can tell, and with lots of mysteries associated to it. Yeah, I hope uh, I hope that's a bit of a uh, bit of an answer to her question. Not sure. Yeah, well, I, I think these string technologies really are very interesting. It's something that we ignore, uh, you know, in Europe, uh, but but they are a fascinating area which uh, deserves a lot more attention. I think. Yeah. Thank you. I think we're probably going to have to wind up because we're kind of, Jerome's been um, hard at work all day. Um, Helen, you had a very interesting comment in the chat regarding the um, the relationships of the big men, the Bantu big men, um, and their dependence on the forest hunter gatherers um, in the Bantu migrations. I thought that was really quite an interesting. Uh, comment there potentially um this is helen here um and i don't know if jerome has anything to add yeah i mean i that. i think it it, it it is central to these big men that they have relationships with the first people if they don't they're illegitimate and it really is remarkable right across the basin still today whenever you have an enthronement ritual if uh, they can't if the the so wannabe chief cannot get uh, hunter-gatherers, local hunter-gatherers, to be present and enthrone him from Rwanda, Burundi, all the way across to the, the Atlantic coast. Uh, their people, their own people, will not consider them to be a real chief, a legitimate chief. So it is something that's very much uh, ingrained in this, uh, this whole region uh, and, and very central to the process of movement and migration through it. Thank you. And um, I think we'd better say thank you to Jerome. He's been working so hard. It's a wonderful talk today. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm uh, my apologies to the people on Zoom that we lost the vision. I hope we'll be able to recover it pro properly for you next week. Next week's talk is by John Grigsby um, on uh, ri uh, River of Milk, Road of Ashes, the Milky Way in um, myth and archaeo astronomy. So this will focus on Celtic mythology to significant and Celtic um, sites as well, um, significantly. So I hope you'll be able to join us again on Zoom. I'm gonna say goodbye to the Zoom people. Bye, Bye. to everybody. Bye-bye, thank you. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, Leoncia. Thank you for everybody for turning up.